Hello and welcome to Asthma, COPD, Same or Different. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. Hopefully I can make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk about asthma and COPD, starting off with asthma. Asthma is an allergic, or it has an allergic base to it, type of a condition that causes the patient to have wheezing. So this is one of the conditions, one of the things we have to think about when we are considering whether it's asthma or COPD. Both of these situations can cause the patient to have wheezing, can cause the patient to have sputum production and a cough. So which one is it? Well, in asthma, we have this underlying allergy that is causing the airways to be hyperactive, and then that causes bronchoconstriction and mucus production. So now if we back this thing up a little bit, we'll see that there is an initiating factor that creates the allergy. So with allergy, we have this initiating factor that occurs first, so maybe that first exposure, and then we have a repeat exposure and that stimulates the allergy. During allergy, we have inflammation occurring in the lung. So part of that allergic response is inflammation, and with inflammation, we get the bronchoconstriction. We also get mucus production because we have uh, capillary permeability, and we have these white blood cells, and et cetera, that are being released into the area, assuming that this, whatever it is, is uh, maybe bacterial, we need to have that inflammation occur to try to ward it off. However, in this case, it is allergy that's causing the problem, so we're going to have mucus production and bronchoconstriction. In some patients with asthma, we can move on down this line all the way to severe asthma. That's the patient that is going to develop hypoxemia and hypercarbia. In other words, that's the patient with a high CO2, the low O2, who needs to be intubated and ventilated. There's a circadian influence to our breathing. Now, if you have normal breathing, you don't have COPD or asthma, you probably don't notice this a whole lot. Maybe you notice that if you're exercising, there are certain times of the day that you seem to feel like you can breathe better. So you go out and you run, and one time of the day it seems like you're laboring more than another time of the day. And that's because of these chemicals. Now, these are profound in patients who have asthma and COPD. At night, we primarily have melatonin running the show, and that's going to cause the patient to have more bronchoconstriction. During the day, we have more cortisol that's running the show, and that's going to cause the patient to have more bronchodilation. So what are some causes and triggers? Pollution. Now, some of these would make a lot of sense if it's in the air, pollution, smoking, household chemicals, those kind of things. Getting in the lung would certainly be a trigger for asthma. Dust. Remember again that, aller that allergy is the primary basis or the foundation for asthma. So dust, pets, bacteria, and viruses. So the patient gets an infection, and now they have an asthma attack as a result of that infection. Upper respiratory infections very commonly associated with that patient having an asthma attack. One of these triggers that you may find to be a little bit surprising is fatty food. But fatty food can also cause the stimulation of this inflammation in the lung. So let's take a look at some of the symptoms. Obviously, labored breathing, so difficulty breathing, wheezing. So that's one of the common things we associate with either asthma or COPD is we associate wheezing. Maybe some chest pain. Chest pain can occur for a couple of reasons. One, it can occur because of this wheezing and tightness that's in the chest and because of coughing. And we're using some of those accessory muscles we don't normally use. So the frequent cough, the allergy, or the upper respiratory looking thing, and the common cold. Those things all may be symptoms. Now, the common cold, obviously, would be something that maybe is stimulating the whole process. 
Remember again, there's a circadian pattern to the hormones that control breathing. So oftentimes we'll see that the patient is developing sleep problems as well. So what are the risk factors for severe attacks? Previous severe asthma attacks would be a number one risk factor. So we're going to look for that in our patient. Not all patients with asthma will have severe attacks. In fact, even some patients who have pretty severe symptoms of asthma never have a severe attack. A severe attack is defined by having hypoxemia and hypercarbia. So having a high CO2 and a low oxygen level is the definition of what is a severe attack. Severe attacks will result in the patient having to be intubated and ventilated. Long-term steroid therapy, so patients who've required steroids for a long period of time, the very young, the very old, typically have less control over their inflammatory and immune systems. Non-compliance with medication, which often goes hand in hand with psychiatric illness, Warning signs of a severe attack include subjective increase in dyspnea. So that's the patient's telling you, I feel like I can't catch my breath. Now, they may not look like they're that out of breath, but if they're telling you, I feel like I can't catch my breath, they're feeling those airways closing up. Increases in sleep disturbances, use of nocturnal bronchodilators, that's a very frequent one. Remember, again, that circadian pattern Breathing is worse at night, so they're going to be using the bronchodilator at night. That would be one of the questions we'd want to ask this asthmatic is, are you using your bronchodilator more at night? If they say yes, well, as a matter of fact, I am, okay, that would be an indication that this asthma attack is getting worse. Morning chest stiffness or heaviness, indicating that we've got a lot of bronchoconstriction or coughing at night. An increase in cough frequency or severity. And lastly, the runny nose or sneezing bouts. Remember again, this has an allergic component to it. The treatment will be beta agonists. So those are your inhalers, et cetera, your uh, albuterol nebulizer. Steroids, okay, so steroids help tomorrow. The beta agonists, the bronchodilators, help today. Steroids are going to help to slow down that inflammatory process, but it takes a while for that steroid to work. So you're not going to get an immediate response from the steroid. IV magnesium is used in some cases of patients, especially in severe asthma. Magnesium relaxes. It relaxes the vasculature. It relaxes the heart. It also relaxes the lung and the airways. So it can open up the airways and we can help to treat asthma. Not a first line drug, obviously, because if we can give some bronchodilators, that would be probably our first line drug, rather than giving IV magnesium, which could have a lot of cardiovascular effects. Antibiotics may be necessary if there was an, some kind of a infection that caused this thing to begin. Assisted ventilation, and in patients with asthma, we prefer to use assisted ventilation why using intubation and ventilation. They don't do very well with using BiPAP. Now that's different in COPD. In COPD patients, COPD patients do very well with BiPAP. Asthma patients, not so much. Now you may have, uh, you may try it. You know, certainly it doesn't hurt to try uh, doing some BiPAP, but a lot of times we have a hard time keeping the mask on the patient. We have a hard time. It's just not enough ventilation or enough support for the patient who has asthma. Manage the anxiety. Now, you know, in patients who have COPD, they have trouble breathing all the time. So they kind of get used to it. They kind of get used to the uh, epinephrine surge in the body and all that other kind of stuff. But your asthmatic doesn't. In many cases, they breathe normally most of the time, and then they have this attack. Now, remember in the attack what's happening. We're having bronchoconstriction. We're not getting enough air. The patient may be hypoxic, and so that is causing a release of the sympathetic nervous system. So, yeah, they're anxious. <laughs> so we need to try to manage that a little bit because that anxiety is going to lead to more stress with them not being able to breathe. Control the allergy and immune modification. These are the things that are going to be done long-term to try to control asthma in these patients. Interestingly, exposure to cats and dogs in the first year of life led to less incidence of asthma in patients. Isn't that interesting? 
probably built up some immune response to those allergens. COPD, on the other hand, can be broken down into two major categories. We can talk about it in terms of emphysema, which is the enlargement of those terminal air spaces and the destruction of the walls. So this is the breaking down of the lung, the emphysema part. The other part of it is chronic bronchitis, which is a chronic productive cough. What causes that chronic bronchitis or the chronic productive cough is going to be lots of mucus production on a regular basis as a result of inflammation. We think it may be that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can lead to this overproduction of inflammation in some of our patients. If your patient has COPD and has never smoked, you might want to think about the possibility of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency being the cause of this COPD. So where does it come from? Well, the vast majority, 80 to 90 percent of COPD, is the result of cigarette smoking. Of course, air pollution and uh, some of the occupational hazards. Of course, they've gotten better over the years. We've got better masks, etc., for firefighters and so on. But uh, air pollution is certainly a problem. There may be a genetic link with COPD from one family member to another. Hyperreactive airways is part of the whole picture. And then this alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in some of our COPD patients. The three main things that happen with COPD are alveolar destruction, that's that emphysema part, airway irritation, those are the airways are chronically being irritated. Now, initially, they're being irritated by whatever this thing is that's causing a problem. Cigarette smoke, air pollution, etc. But the irritation continues as a result of inflammation. The third component, then, is the sputum production that occurs as a result of inflammation. So let's take a look at what this looks like. If you take a look at these two different pictures, the healthy and the emphysema at the top, you see the healthy, normal, grape-like looking alveoli, and then the air trapped in the alveoli on the one to the right. Notice that the alveoli are enlarged in the picture to the right. Now, if you remember from anatomy and physiology, alveoli have this web of blood vessels that go around the alveolus. So as that alveolus starts to enlarge and become bigger and bigger and bigger, it's compressing the blood vessels and will actually end up with a shunt where blood is shunting past those capillaries without becoming oxygenated. And that's where some of our hypoxia and some of our increase in CO2 comes from. Another component that's happening in COPD is that at the bottom we have the healthy open airway and on the right we have the inflammation, kind of abbreviated there. So we have excess mucus that's being produced and this inflamed airway. So the inflamed airway is narrowed, first of all. Okay, so you can see that it's narrowed. And then it also has mucus in there that further blocks the airway. So we're going to give a bronchodilator that will help to open up the airway, but we're still going to have mucus. So we have to treat that piece, too. The signs and symptoms of COPD, of course, we're going to do pulmonary function tests, and we're going to look at the function. That can give us a good idea as to what's happening here with our patient's pulmonary function. But we're going to look for hypercapnia. We're going to look for hypoxia, hypoxemia. We're going to look for the dyspnea. Okay, so the patient complains of having difficulty breathing when they're maybe walking up a flight of stairs or just walking around the house. Fatigue, a productive cough, changes in the amount or color of sputum. Wheezing, paradoxical respirations. Okay, so the chest rises and the abdomen uh, is moving and they're moving paradoxically because we're using all those accessory muscles of respiration. Need for ICU transfer would be in situations where the patient has respiratory muscle fatigue, a need for ventilatory assistance, refractory hypoxemia, respiratory acidosis with a pH less than 7.30, or cardiovascular instability. So how do we treat it? Well, we use bronchodilation. First thing we could use is just a meter-dosed inhaler four puffs with a meter dose inhaler and spacer 
or we can give 2.5 milligrams via an aerosol treatment. So use a nebulizer and aerosol. Some studies show no effect on airway resistance by using albuterol in bronchodilating. Only about 3% of what we're giving to the patient actually ends up in the airway. A lot of it ends up in the oropharynx and never makes it down to the airway. That is especially true with our meter dose inhaler. However, if we're using a spacer with a meter dose inhaler, we still get or we get a larger amount that is going down into the airways. But still you can see, I think a lot of times we think, okay, we give the patient an inhaler, they take a couple puffs on the inhaler, and they're going to be great. Not necessarily. Okay, that doesn't necessarily make it all the way down to the airways and the part where the problem is. Steroids. Steroids are an anti-inflammatory agent, so they're going to help to decrease the inflammation that's being caused by this chronic inflammatory process. You have 60 to 125 milligrams IV for 24 hours, and then 60 to 80 milligrams PO tapering over uh, for 10 to 14 days. Watch for infection because steroids are not only knocking out the inflammation, they're also knocking out our immune response, and the patient can become infected. So this is showing some of the different processes that are occurring here with inflammation. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to decrease this inflammation so it's not continuing. Our glucocorticoid over there in the upper left-hand corner is going to block that inflammatory process so that inflammation does not continue. So it's going to stop that process. Now, what often happens is the patient stops taking the steroid the inflammation comes back and they start having problems again because there's this chronic stimulation of inflammation in that COPD patient. Other types of therapy that may be helpful, anticholinergics. So anticholinergics help to inhibit that vagal mediated smooth muscle contraction. Atrovent is a very common one. Aminophilin is a smooth muscle relaxant, has lots and lots of side effects especially cardiac side effects. So you think about the patients who have COPD. A lot of those patients are older and they have cardiac issues to begin with. So aminophilin would not be a good choice. But it is a possibility in some of our patients. Antipyretics, certainly we want to get temperature down if the patient is having a fever. Fever is going to increase oxygen consumption, so we try and get that temperature down so that we're meeting the oxygen demand of the body. Oxygen may be necessary. We've all learned that, well, you don't have to, you don't want to give too much oxygen to this patient who has COPD. If you give them too much oxygen, they'll stop breathing. That's long term. You put oxygen on a patient who has COPD, 100% oxygen on a patient who has COPD, and leave them there for a month, they might stop breathing. The respiratory rate may go down so far, they might stop breathing. However, there have been studies that have looked at giving oxygen to COPD patients and what happens? Does it make them stop breathing? <laughs> Wouldn't you want to be in that study? <laughs> anyway, so what they found was that even on a 100% non-rebreather mask, patients' respiratory rates only went down as far as 8. Now, a respiratory rate of 8 in a COPD patient is not going to be good because we're not blowing off enough CO2. But you can give that patient some oxygen in the acute phase, get them over the hump, and then we wean the oxygen off so that we take them back down to where, quote, where they live with a um, oxygen saturation maybe of 89%. But we don't let somebody just sit there at 89 just because, hey, that's where they live, and we're afraid they're going to stop breathing if we give them oxygen. Good pulmonary hygiene, really important in these patients. Remember, they're developing lots of secretions. We need to get those secretions moving. So here's our comparison of asthma versus COPD. Asthma generally in younger patients versus older patients for COPD. The underlying cause of asthma is allergy. The underlying cause of COPD is a chronic inflammation. Asthma, even though it has a chronic type of underlying process, is acute in nature. Patients with asthma often have no trouble breathing at all unless they're having an asthma attack. Asthma typically affects the upper airways versus the lower airways with COPD. There's little sputum produced in asthma, but quite a bit of sputum produced in COPD. 
The spirometry in patients with asthma usually will normalize, especially if they're on long-term medications. Spirometry in COPD typically is going to decline over time. We're going to focus on the allergy and the immune modification in our asthma patient, whereas we're focusing on decreasing inflammation and secretions in the COPD patient. Well, thank you for joining me today for asthma versus COPD, same or different. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 